What an episode we have for you today. We are joined by Dr. Patrick groman Kotua, who is the Senior Manager for Analytics and Data Science in Procurement for Deutsche Bahn. So we will be covering the value of data in procurement, especially when you're handling budgets the size of Deutsche Bahn. We will be talking about some use cases and the importance of building trust and community to drive true business value. Enjoy. Welcome back to the podcast. Today we're joined by Patrick and we're going to be talking about data and data in procurement. So yeah, thank you for joining us today, Patrick. Why um, why is it so important that we talk about data in procurement? Why is it so valuable? Well, well, first of all, thanks for having me. Yeah, I've been looking forward to it. Um, well, first of all, data itself is not valuable, right? So data, data science, AI is always a means to an end. Um, I think, especially in procurement though, what you can do with it and what you can achieve with data for the business um, in terms of value and impact is, um, is really, really interesting. And yeah, I'm looking forward to getting into it. Nice, so people think of data, especially around tech it's customer value it's lifetime journey we're, we're talking about different beasts today you're, you're um you've been working at deutsche bahn for for quite some time now and procurement at uh at deutsche bahn is a, is a big beast it's going into the to the billions so what is the power of each euro saved in procurement from from your perspective as especially introducing us to data products within deutsche bahn well, first of all, you know, you put it right that procurement, when you think about procurement, it's, it's typically, first of all, about saving money, right? Mm -hmm. um, and to put this into perspective, you said procurement at Deutsche Bahn is quite a large unit, and it is, it's more than a thousand people. Um, and central procurement at Deutsche Bahn buys most of what Deutsche Bahn needs to run its business and um, an entire um, railway system, if you will. Mm -hmm. So procurement buys um, tunnels, tracks, bridges, stations, trains, of course, everything you need in terms of parts for the, for the trains, interior for the trains, all services Deutsche Bahn needs, IT services, cleaning, security, um, what have you. Um, also, stuff like pencils, mm, laptops, yeah, everything else, desks, tables. Um, so this is all we have to buy. And last year, Central Procurement spent roughly twenty-seven billion um, to buy everything Deutsche Bahn needs. And well, now let's circle back to data. Um, if the goal, if one major goal is to save uh, money. Um, why is that? Well, because of course we're all cost sensitive. We, we don't want to overspend. That's that's clear. But mm -hmm. procurement is one of the biggest and quickest levers for profitability. Um, because every euro you save in procurement um, incre directly increases earnings. Right, so one euro saved is one euro more EBIT, and mm -hmm. uh, and that's a powerful relationship. So if you can harness data to help save money, that's that is value for the mm -hmm. business. And one more thing, mm. it's not that easy right, um, to, to find, to provide value, but you mm -hmm. have to in terms of value because you are not, as a data unit in procurement, you're best served to not consider yourself as a serving service unit, right? Yeah. So customer come to you, um, tell you about their problems, want you to do some analysis, solve their problems right now. That's good and valuable. And I can give you examples of how we did it and how we helped saving money. But if you want to scale and you want to become a value driver in data, then you proactively look at what the business problems are and how you can contribute. And you had talks in your 
our um, podcast series about um, understanding business, for example, which is absolutely crucial. Yeah. So, I mean, 27, if, if we start from the, the very beginning, so before you start making an impact, surely getting to that figure is super complex in itself. So before you even look at savings, understanding what you're spending. So how complex is it just getting hold of that data? Yeah, spend transparency is, is, is like the first step, right? Knowing what you spend your money on, how much you spend on it, what the prices are in comparison to the market. Um, and as I will probably start off a lot of answers in this podcast with it depends, right? Yeah. And, and so it does in, in this case, we have some areas, for example, um, mm, like, like everything that's not related to tunnels, and, and bridges infrastructure projects um, is much easier to 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 overview and to to see how prices are developing, right? Um, so that's easier. But on the other hand, it's just it's still a challenge. Yeah. But that you know, even if you're if you're not if spend transparency can always be improved. You mm -hmm. just have to be good enough, and uh, right um, and there's still many more options or routes to go, business opportunities to pursue with data. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so you've got you've got that figure, you've got the trust from maybe the board that right, that's how much we're spending. Now you want to be looking for kind of opportunities to turn from a service based function into a more value driver. Okay. So, data products is something that spoke about a lot. What does that mean to Deutsche Bahn and your team in particular in procurement? Yeah. Um, let me start off a couple of years ago where we did not think in terms of data products and value driving. We just started off with, you know, we had this, there was this notion data can be really valuable. Mm. It, it's supposed, it must be. So we just started. The new oil. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> So, so we just started up. What what did we do? We um, we were trying to, you know, people did ideation back then, right? I'm um, getting people from the business and finding ideas how we can um, contribute to to solving real problems of our purchases and our procurement. Mm -hmm. So we came up with a couple of ideas. Um, one was um, optimization of price scales in um, in framework agreements, right? Um, that was one idea. The other one was, uh, well, how can we um, prevent our suppliers to somehow, you know, talk to each other beforehand, fix prices? So we came up with a cartel screening use case. Um, okay. So that's kind of cost avoidance, risk mitigation. Um, then we came with, up with another one that's really basic is, can we have in one place as much information on our suppliers as possible from different sources? Right. That's not just spent. How much do we spend across the company um, or how much money goes towards that supplier and what prices, what kind of contracts do we have? But it's also what's their sustainability rating? What's their credit rating? All, all these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that was another another use case and a couple more. Right. And, and many of it was really basic, just providing the right information and basic data in terms of business, you know, business intelligence, basically, mm -hmm. um, to have purchases just, you know, have a good um, foundation in, um, when they go into their negotiations. Um, cartel screening is a little different. There was a lot of data science involved as well, but that was the only one. So there were low hanging fruits. Yeah. We thought at first, these are low hanging fruits. Right, you just get the data together, and that's it. You do some mm -hmm. on it, but and then you get to know about what's the structure like in your company, how many systems, what's the data quality like, and so on and so forth. Okay, so we had first ideas, and then along the way, of course, you always have the challenge. Um, well, I know I, I put it differently. You have to be very conscious and careful of how you. Um, position data and analytics in your company. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because we were, our first aim was to provide value quick. Um, and we were able to achieve that. But then people 
you know, get to know, oh, there's this team who can somehow do the data and just, you know, tell me everything I need to know when I need to know it. And, you know, yeah. I'll, you know, just, um, love it. spreads fast. Yeah, exactly. And then you just someone, uh, there, there's the danger of becoming a team that solves, like does all these ad hoc analyses. And so that happened. And I think it does happen to a lot of data teams to some degree, and that's okay because that's, you do provide value, mm -hmm. but then you have to somehow switch roles and switch perception. And that's where you, you start becoming a value driver. And, and, and that's where data products come into play. But from my perspective, um, when you talk about data products, it's, it's really about, um, perspective. How do you look at what you provide at the output and outcome of what you're doing as a data team. Um, in when people come to you to solve their problems, you're solving the problems. That's okay. If you if you have a data product thinking, you are actively trying to identify a market or even develop a market. You are actively going out there trying to identify customers' problems. What would make them pay? for something you provide to them, what mm -hmm. would make them, I don't know, what would make them miss you once you're unit? Yeah. Okay? yeah? So, and, and that's, that's a whole different mindset. And it starts with, um, yeah, knowing your business and you had an entire episode on that, but that's, that's crucial. Right? <laughs> Do you think it's an easier driver for some, somewhere like procurement? Cause it's so black and white when it comes to the end figure it's a it's a monetary value it's a, it's a euro figure so it's easier to educate or convince the business that you are driving value is that what you experienced it helps it helps tremendously because what, what happens is i mean you have different ways of providing value of course and i guess mm -hmm. most most of people listening to this know know it, right? You yeah. have, of course, monetary value. Then you have, have cost avoidance. Um, you can have, you save time, right? Like people's hours, like working hours. Mm -hmm. work. And when you have cases like, you know, um, saving working hours, you always have some assumptions and you need to, you know, you calculate it, you have a business case and it's either, con it's, it should be convincing and then afterwards, how do you measure success of your use case um, is can be tricky in procurement when it comes to saving euros it's it's also tricky but um it's very tangible right because it is about money uh, let me give you one example we had a and now i come back this is an example that's actually an ad hoc analysis example um we had a, a negotiation team come to us. Um, they were um, preparing for a tender of um, a logistics framework agreement, right? So yeah. getting stuff from A to B for Deutsche Bahn, right? Um, and they, uh, they wanted to design the, the tender. And in order for that, they were, especially among other things, looking for bundling potentials in the different routes. Yeah. So they asked us if we could support and we were able to um, um, analyze data from over 100,000 different shippings we had data on mm -hmm. and provided them, them with information about bundling potentials. And they used this information to reduce prices um, by more than 1 million euros. So, and we spent five days on this one ad hoc analysis. And they, based on that information, of course, they were the expert in the negotiation, yeah, yeah. right? Without them, nothing would have happened, but without us, less would have happened, right? So, so that's of course very convincing. And you're lucky if that happens and if the, the business attests you, yeah, you definitely helped us save exactly that figure. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and that helps to get management backing and, and buy-in and, a little more freedom to not just do like the, the tip of the iceberg fancy stuff, but to lay the groundwork to um, be um, successful in the long term. How, how do you strike that balance? You've, you've done an ad hoc analysis in five days, you've saved a million 
in theory. You've saved a, you saved a million euros. That's a lot of value to a business. How how do you balance that with the more longer term kind of vision and maybe say, say five million euros, but it's not immediate? Yeah. Well, if you have a convincing business case, at least a DB procurement works. Right, and if there's a need, again, we come back to market uh, and and um, customer centricity. Right, what kind of problems do you solve, and do is it a problem that management management always also sees, and and is, is the business case convincing? Then you get the backing, and you just do it. But um, I think that's that's not so much a challenge if you find the right problems. The bigger challenge is to get the freedom to do the groundwork right um, um make sure you have the foundation to really also in the future be able to um contribute and that's and then we come to having processes in place um having proper structure um having good data quality right yeah. um data quality is key and it's something people especially when they think you know data is the new oil some people still think that um then they think, okay, and next year we're going to have tremendous benefits, and they forget that to have also have tremendous benefits in, in less low, higher hanging fruits, right? Yeah. Then, um, then you need to invest in data quality, and that takes a lot of good, a lot of convincing, a lot of good storytelling. Um, not just storytelling, storyline. You have to tell the right story, and it's got to be convincing. And, and that brings me to again, how do you become a value driver? Mm -hmm. and if you'd like to go i can just illustrate that for yeah please do go into that let's take data quality at some point is my assumption i mean we were at the point and i'm i i think many data teams and many companies get to that point where they realize that their data quality is somehow limiting their success in their um in terms of how much value they get out of data mm -hmm. and what do you do when you get to that point? Um, you can have, there are different approaches, right? Let's say you're a large, large company, you have a hundred systems and, and let's also assume in most of them, data quality is um, maybe terrible. <laughs> okay. So what do you do? You have a hundred. Um, you can't tackle data quality all at once because typically it take, it's a management and a change. Um, yeah. Uh, um, not so much something that data people have to do, but something that management has to be aware of and processes have to be implemented, which also means that it's typically, and especially in this day and age, they're not going to hire new people to improve data quality. And that means you have to, um, people who have to invest in data quality from the business have to do that on top of their existing workload. And That's not going to happen, right? Not for 100. It's tedious. No way, um, in my opinion. So what do you do? Um, you can just pick one and, and start with that and um, mm -hmm. find someone who's interested and thinks, OK, I'm, I'm, I understand. I, I want to do this. And I will be willing to invest my time to improve data quality. I don't know, some some leader in the, in the company who, who makes sure that data quality in the process is, is improved. OK. Mm. But, what tells you that the, the system you picked is, is the right one, right? Um, and what, what's the criteria for it, the criterion? And um, I think that the best approach to determine to pick your battles regarding data quality yeah. is start with the business, see what are, what, what's the business trying to achieve? What are the different business units even trying to achieve this year, next year, the year after? and um, trying to look at do we have existing data products typically currently still dashboards that would yeah. help them achieve their business goal if yes sometimes people are not aware that there's something existing you know helping them okay then letting them know but if not what does it take in terms of data products to help you achieve your goal okay and what type of data does it take to implement these data products mm. and what's the quality of the data 
And, and then you get this data value chain where you identify um, a business goal, potential use cases or data products that could help. And you can identify a, well, what do you say? Uh, how do you put that? Um, like where data quality um, blocks you, right? Then you identify the right data source where you say, okay, this is the most valuable data source for these three business goals because these four crucial data products cannot provide their full value because data quality is lacking. Let's please focus on this one or two sources and management, you understand if we don't do this, you will not reach your goals, your own goals. Mm. And this is what it takes. Are you willing to do this? And this is a lot of work. So, so you're working from the business goal backwards or are the, are the data team being the educators and saying, hey, it's better that we chip away at these three because it's achievable and we can get it done and we can get near perfect data quality for these? Or are we thinking business value, even if it's a big, hairy, audacious project, you, you target that one first? I always think, uh, I try to... I mean, in, in, in practice, it's, <coughs> it's both on a way, in a way, right? I, uh, it depends again, but um, I, it's more and more of um, like a value centric thing, right? Mm -hmm. Value first. And let's understand that people are not sponsoring data, data teams investing in data. Management does not invest in data. If they don't see an outcome, an, out, yeah, an outcome actually. And you have to start with what they are interested in and focus on that. And and of course, you you have to find the right level of abstraction when you tell your story, right? Um, it's not about which models do we use, what kind of accuracy do they have, um, all that kind of stuff is not important. It's, it's really um, they don't need to know, right? They don't well, need to know the inner workings. They don't. They, they they want to know how the car gets from A to B. They don't need to know how the engine works, right? Yeah, but they need to know what to fix on the car if if, if the car doesn't get you from A to B, and and they need to be willing willing to 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 invest in in the repair. <laughs> which is which is the case that with fixing our cars right now, we we don't tend to know what's going on. We need someone to, to educate us and say, hey, if you don't fix this, then you're not getting there. Yeah. Or it's deteriorating, or if you change this, you're going to improve performance. Yeah. Similar yeah. aspects. And you just, yeah, but you just mentioned two different things, actually. And that's 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 part of um, data leaders' job, I think, to, to point out both and to even, um, uh, instead of, you know, if you don't fix this, you won't get to A, right? From A to B, actually, yeah, you won't get to B. But if you do this, then you're going to get there even faster. You, you'll, you'll burn less gas, right? All these kind of things. That would be ideas that management or business probably doesn't have the right knowledge about data and algorithms and stuff to come up with these ideas itself. That's your job. And that, yeah. that makes you a value driver. Then people turn to you. Okay, I have this problem. Um, um, I need to procure more and I cannot grow my, my, my staff, for example. How do I do this? I need to save more money because maybe costs need to be, need to be cut dramatic, uh, dra um, drastically. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's that's what I, what you ultimately want to achieve, I guess. People turning to you, asking you for advice and for ideas, instead of telling you that you know, fix this, do this. I need this dashboard dashboard A B C, um, which is yeah. well. But and if we if we stick to the car analogy, it's as a data person, we may think that the business wants to get from A to B as quick as possible, where in reality they want to get there as safely as possible. So rather than focusing on speed, which we think um, is the biggest driver there. They want to get there as safe as possible, which is a completely different um, angle. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I agree.
Nice. And I know a quote that you like is uh, data is power um, and trust is required. So following on from this community, trust and relationships, how, how do you build them? Where have your challenges or fallbacks been? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I highly value trust and uh, community to, to achieve ultimately what you want to achieve um, for the business because you said data is power. Yes, it is. I think in a, in a company, um, not just in, in you know the company competing with other companies in the market, but maybe even um, people within the company, um, data is power. Why is that? Well, if you have access to data and no one else has access to, or it's only limited, of course you have a, a information advantage, but also you have power over how that data gets interpreted, which is important, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're the data owner and you have access to it, you decide how it's interpreted. There's, I have come across fear when it comes to data sharing. If I give share my data, how are people going to interpret it? You know, are they going to twist? Mm -hmm. Are they going to have, I don't know, yeah, actually different interpretation, come up with a different message to other people that may make people insecure for good reasons for good reasons yeah completely understandable um so that's a problem or a challenge actually if you if you if you're building your business on data and you need data to 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 help your business hmm. and and also another thing is data is closely linked to transparency right goes in the same direction if I have data, I can look at things more objectively and I have more transparency about how things are going, maybe in mm. the company. And this is where trust comes into play and network and relationships. I think you have to look at it from, from two perspectives. You have to really invest in, in trusting relationships in order to have people trust you that you're not doing funny stuff with their data, if you, if you want their data. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's really personal. It's, it's about, you know, first of all, you need to have a, a track record of being trustworthy, delivering on your promises. That's, that's true. But also you have to just be able to connect with people and that's people from the business side, of course. And then there's in the, let's say in the, we have a Deutsche Bank, we have an analytics community, so we have a central team which I um, am fortunate um, to have. And um, the uh, and we have other data specialists in the different parts of procurement mm. and form a community. And why is that important? Well, because if you don't, you need to know what do people look like? What do they, what do they care about? Do they like going to the gym? Do, when they go to the gym, do they just work on upper body and they avoid working on legs? You know, all everyone, these... everyone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you just need, need to know those things to be able to connect, not just to, you know, in a very calculated way, because it's, that's my, I'm convinced that that's what makes like working with people so valuable and so enjoyable you get to know them you get to connect with them much easier and then based on that on that foundation you can um there's trust there's more transparency and stemming from that transparency you get things done much faster hmm. to talk to they trust either you've helped them before that's why they're inclined to help you now Maybe they just like you because you're just doing upper body in the gym just like they are, right? Yeah. And they just want to help you because they like you and you like them. So that's, it's so, it's not, you know, no business case behind it. Nothing ta um, tangible, no hard facts. It's all, all about relationship. And I, I came to value this part of working in data um, tremendously in the last couple of years. Nice. What what a fantastic way to to, to finish up. Um, trust is key. I think is that the main point we're finishing up there. Um, talking about community, um, where can people find more about the work you're doing? Keep up with uh, what you've got lined up. Yeah. Well, I'd be happy if people um, just jump on my LinkedIn profile. Just I'd be happy to connect. Drop me a message if you have any questions or like to just uh, interested in exchange, um, have similar problems, have other problems. I, I 
really enjoy that. I'm talking about um, network relationships and trust. And um, if you'd like to know more about our use cases and what we do in procurement, there's an um, Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung article that came out in yeah, almost two years ago. Mm -hmm. I can link that in the show notes. Um, I also I gave a couple of talks um, early in the year. One of them is on YouTube. We can link to that and you get some more insight on actually the cartel screening and on another use case and some challenges we came across. So if you like that, just you know, take a look. And again, I, um, I'd be looking forward to everyone reaching out. Awesome. Yeah, we'll link them them all in. This is a, a bite-sized kind of intro. Um, we can link the YouTube video and you can find out a lot more and do reach out to Patrick. But that is all uh, we have time for today. Thank you, Patrick, once again for joining us. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Until next time. Ciao, ciao. Bye. 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 Bye.